Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Polar Horizons talk this week. This week, uh, we've got a biological oceanographer, Dr. Sophie Fielding. Uh, she joined Bass in 2005 and specializes in using acoustic observations to understand how ecosystems are responding to changing oceanic conditions. She must have a very exciting uh, professional life. She runs with projects that are called things like Rapid Krill and Krill Hotspots and Comics. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about Sophie's journey. Uh, she is a seagoing woman in marine science and I'd like to welcome you to having a chat with us. Hi, thanks Donna. Um, yeah, I, so no, Donna asked me to, to share some of my journey. Um, I think it was in, in response to a comment I made in one of the previous Polar Horizons discussions where I kind of said, I only really finished my PhD so I could get um, a promotion. Um, that's probably not the, the ideal thing to start with, but it's a very relevant one for anybody who's out there. And uh, so, you know, just to think about, but, um, so this, this, the content of this talk is kind of inspired from the last five or six months. It includes things like, um, I think, Nicole's uh, talk a few weeks ago, where, you know, it highlighted the importance of role models um, and, and kind of um, maybe seeing those people or, or maybe not even recognising that, 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 that they're your role model. Um, and so I've, I've kind of put up some, some figures here that in my journey uh, through marine science, I've actually retrospectively ident identified some people who I think have, have kind of, I think I decided that they were called subliminal role models. So I've looked back in time and looked at people who are around at that time, who I think really demonstrated to me that it was just the norm, if you like, or, or, or at least it should be accepted as just the norm. Um, of, of things going forward. Um, and then the other side of it also is that um, uh, I got involved uh, in an article led by Kate Henry, and she's, she's here in the audience, I believe, um, at the beginning of lockdown. Um, and, and I think Kate might have something to add, but it, it was a very, very interesting journey into uh, women in marine science and seagoing women in marine science and a discussion about equality uh, and actually later equity. Um, so I'm, let's hold on, see if I can actually uh, move forward. So thinking just to the, the origin of, of women, um, and I've taken this direct from Kate's, Kate's article, in fact, that's just about to come out. Um, and so um, the history of uh, seagoing women in research, um, I think Kate wrote it as beginning in 1766, where women went to sea um, dressed as boys um, so, that, that, so that they could go and take their research um, and work alongside uh, men at sea. Um, and so this is Jean Barrette, who I think was identified as, as one of the first um, seagoing women in research. Um, in, the, in the UK, um, we start to find models such as Rosa Lee, who was the first woman to graduate in mathematics from Bangor University and be, became employed by the Marine Biological uh, Association as a statistician. Um, and then I kind of wanted to put up a picture of a cruise that I did uh, last year um, in 2019. And these were actually some of the photographs that were tweeted, I believe, at the time of, of examples of, of women in science. Um, and I, I, I kind of thought it was a an interesting comparison that none of them are dressed up as boys anymore to try and, um, and you know, and, and we get to be more more of a, um, ourselves. And I think that's very, very important. Um, so during this article um, and the discussions that, that Kate and myself and, and, and other people were having, um, it's, uh, I think it's very hard to move around the arena of what is qualitative discussion and what is quantitative discussion and, and what's correct and what isn't correct. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to show you some data in this talk, the origin of which is it actually comes from cruise reports. Um, they're uploaded onto the BODSI website. For anybody who doesn't know, that's the British Oceanographic Data Centre. Um, and those cruise reports date back to 1965. 
Um, and they are from our four national research vessels, Discovery 3, which is no longer around, um, the James Cook uh, and Discovery 4, which are operated by NAC, and the James Clark Ross um, that's operated by ourselves. Now, this is a kind of a historical data collection. And so in that, the gender identities outside of male and female uh, binary um, were not considered um, and I think um, you know I think it's a, a discussion maybe for the future about how how that could be how that could be looked at um, and the second part of this is, is gender presentation um, so it's not it's it's not gender it's gender presentation and it's determined from personal knowledge contact in some cases first names titles um, and or photographs. So one thing that's really interesting about most marine scientists is they write a long list of names of the scientists who've been involved um, on the ship and they put this in the cruise report. And so that's that's where this data comes from. Um, I wanted to put it in this forum because I'd really welcome any feedback um, throughout this uh, and, and the, even the method of looking at historical changes is challenging. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, put it out there. So what you'll find is in many of the photographs I'm about to show you in the, in the bottom right of the screen, you will see some statistics that's taken from this data set or some statements that are made. And those statements are made as the percentage of uh, people presenting as women uh, as part of the science complement of the party and the uh, percentage of PSOs um, presenting as women that are, that are the, the chief scientists, if you like, uh, of those cruises. So um, anyone, anyone know my exact birth year, but 1974, if you want, 6% um, of cruise participants presented as women and 0% chief scientists. Um, you know, the honest answer is, was I, was I drawn to water? Probably. I mean, I, I, I've always been a bit of a kind of swimming, boating, doing something near water. Um, whether that influenced right through to my A-levels, I don't know. But I've, I've always quite liked just the pictures, so I thought I'd put them up and say, you know, some, somewhere along the line, I got interested in water. Um, so in 1990, uh, I did my A-levels, um, biology, chemistry and maths. Um, I did those at school in Oxfordshire. And one of the things that we did in Oxfordshire was that we went and had a week-long um, field course at Kilbury Manor in, in Wales. Um, and on one of those days, we went out to a wreck and we, um, we actually were snorkelling around it. But whilst I was there, um, the guy who took us was a fisheries officer and he wanted to go and check one of the lobster fishermen was catching the right size lobsters. And, and he gladly took me along to kind of go and have a chat and see what was going on. And I, I've always kind of presumed that maybe that's where, where marine biology cropped up as a, an interesting subject to go and study. So as we've got here, uh, 1990, 8% um, of cruise participants presented as women and 0% as chief scientists. Um, when it came to choosing a degree, um, I wasn't, I still wasn't fully devoted to my path. I suppose some people are inspired marine biologists right from an early age. Um, I, I think I wavered around a little bit. Um, and in the end, I, I, I imagine really, I, I think I pulled a pin out and kind of waved it around those list of three subjects. Um, it fell on one of them and I looked at it and went, actually, no, I'll do it again. I don't want that one. Um, so somebody was telling me what, what I wanted to do. Um, so I went off to um, Southampton, University of Southampton, um, to do a degree in oceanography with marine biology. Um, and so uh, in that time, so 1992, my first year, 19% of cruise participants presented as women and 0% were chief scientists. Um, one of the people who lectured to me then uh, was Rachel Mills. She was actually a postdoc. Um, she just finished her PhD there. Um, and, you know, just out of interest now, she's, you know, she's, she's still at Southampton. She's professor of uh, um, chemical oceanography there um, and dean of the environmental and life science um, group. Um, the reason I've got a, a a, a hydrothermal vent on the left hand side is is that she she actually went um she went out in one of the dive submersibles onto those hydrothermal vents 
at that time and she was very enthusiastic um, and brought that enthusiasm back into those lecture theatres um, about kind of uh, just oceanographic science, seagoing um, uh, roles that, that could occur. Uh, so after I finished my degree, um, I actually got a job as a postgraduate research assistant. So um, most people now, they finish their degree, they go on to an MSc and then they maybe go and do a PhD um, or not. Um, I actually was probably one of the last people who actually got employed as just a research assistant after finishing their degree. Um, and at that time, uh, I could... Um, I could enrol in a part-time PhD. So that's that's the avenue I took. I decided I'd had enough of being a student and I wanted a job. Um, I was actually employed within the NERC Institute of Oceanographic Science area that contributed to the Oceanography Centre um, by somebody called Howard Rowe. Um, and uh, um, I had a very, I was initially employed on a three-year contract there, um, mostly to look down a microscope. Um, in the laboratory at zooplankton samples. So in 1995, 13% of cruise participants presented as women, 17% as chief scientists. Um, and I think not, not just in 1995, but kind of moving through my time uh, in oceanography at Southampton, there were people like uh, Margaret Yelland, Max Yelland, who's, who's identified here. Um, so I think Max Yelland was the third woman chief scientist on the JCR uh, in 1999 um, and she was somebody I used to bump into the corridors there. She was uh, she's a, an atmospheric um, oceanographer. She was you know commonly ocean going and again I think you know if I look back in time it was just somebody who was like yeah this is what I do this is where I go you know this is this is what you can achieve you could you can it's kind of that you can do it if you like. Um, so, uh, as I said before, I mean, I, so I was doing my PhD part time. I was very fortunate. I, um, I actually got to go to sea in 1996. We seem to have gone backwards a little bit with our cruise participation as women back to 8% and 0% as chief scientists. But you can see there on the right hand side is, is myself. I think there I was 21, 22, just about to go away for eight weeks on my, on my, it was not actually my first cruise, but my first long cruise, it was two months to the Mediterranean. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I can honestly say it was really good fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, it fed into my PhD in the end. So I was uh, using acoustics, using an acoustic Doppler current profiler, um, an ADCP, which is actually a physical oceanography instrument, um, but has a byproduct out of it that it measures the amount of sound scattered um, from the ocean. And that's a proxy for biomass uh, of zooplankton. Um, so on the left hand side, we can just see this is chlorophyll being entrained or subducted um, down a front. So from the surface down to 200 meters. And then at the bottom, this is backscatter. So blue is low scatter, red is high. And what you can see, this period is 24 hours. We have diurnal vertical migration where animals are at the surface at night and descend during the day. And we see that they interrupt that behavior to, to set a food source. I back that up uh, with net samples. Um, and I was sent to see, to be honest, on that first trip, I was sent to see with some photographs of how to put this system together. Um, and uh, um, some explanation, uh, verbal explanation of how it roughly goes over the side. Um, but you know, the, the, the flip side of that is they they um, they let me out there on the deck to put it over. They um, probably uh, amused themselves by convincing me that it had been lost off the wire all the time. Um, but but you know, I had great fun working working outside. Um, and it really is something that I think inspires me to go to sea is just it's a very different environment from the kind of laboratory or, or, or the, I mean, to be honest, for me, it's mostly sat in front of my computer um, analysing data and, and I really enjoy it. So 1997, 15% of cruise participants presented as women and 10% of, of chief scientists. Um, as I said, in 2003, I finished my PhD. Um, you know, I, I commonly say I think PhDs are a, 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 um, 
I've great respect for people who who achieve it because I think it's staying power <laughs> that um, is really the the thing that can drive it in the end. In, in, and in my case, I handed it in in 2003, so it took me quite a while. Um, and so in 2005, um, I saw a job advertised at the British Antarctic Survey, and they were looking for a zooplankton acoustician, somebody to come and join their group um, to look in particular at Antarctic krill um, and also other fish in the water column um, and work. Um, whereas in Southampton, I worked a lot with physical oceanographers and chemical oceanographers, and, and I was at the top end, if you like, of the food chain. I moved to Bass. Um, where obviously we've got lots of uh, higher predator people um, and I'm actually more towards the bottom of the food chain now. Um, so echo sounders, they fire sound into the ocean, it gets returned by uh, particles in the water. Um, in most of the open ocean areas, these particles are animals. And what you can see here is a uh, one kilometer krill swarm that's, um, well, it's krill swarm that's one kilometer long and 100 meters deep. So 2005, 20% of cruise participants presented as women and 15% as chief scientists. Again, coming back to working, um, so my, my role at Bass has taken, taken me to sea every year, actually, since 2005, apart from this year. So it's a, it's a real novelty for me this year. Um, I'm not going to say it's a good novelty either, um, but it's a real novelty for me this year to, to not be going south. Um, the nets got bigger when I moved to Bass. Um, this is an example of a, a rectangular midwater trawl. Um, this one, I believe looking at it is actually the smaller of the two um, that we use, and we use it annually around South Georgia to catch krill. Um, and if I go to here, here's a, an example of the, um, really is a team activity. As you can see, it takes quite a few people working together. Uh, on deck to deploy. We then have people in control of it. Uh, the whole system then comes back in. Um, uh, the samples get brought on board uh, and then you have um, the uh, work up in the laboratories that takes a large number of people um, picking the animals out, identifying what species, what group they are, um, taking whatever samples they want, whether they go into the freezer, uh, whether they go for incubations um, and so on. Um, and so you can see there's obviously lots of thought process that goes on in there as well. Um, and eventually at the end of it, it, it all gets tidied away. But I hope one, you know, one of the things I kind of like to put across, I think, is that there is an, there is an awful lot of teamwork that goes into these, these cruise work that we do. And I think that's also another aspect that I've always really enjoyed. Um, so there we are, finally finished, tied it up. Um, the other thing that in the ecosystems that we do is obviously a cruise is a snapshot in time of going and looking uh, in the water. So we put out moorings um, and those moorings have, have gone out as well since 1996. Um, and so I just thought I'd give you an example also of, of um, what that looks like. Um, again, uh, you can see that uh, so oh, that's mooring being retrieved. So the boy comes in first and then all of the equipment like sediment traps, which are looking at particles falling out in the ocean. Um, I forget what yeah, more sediment traps that are on there. Um, but again, hopefully you can see that there's uh, there's a lot of teamwork that goes on on board the ship um, in order to get these samples uh, retrieved. Uh, where are we? So that's it. Um, so other things that I've got involved in, in 2010, um, I got involved in a reanalysis of the amount of Antarctic krill biomass in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and so I, I kind of thought I'd try and bring some science into it as well as, um, as, well as the photographs of what we've been on the more applied side. Um, in this case, it's another area of the job that I really appreciate, which is um, so my involvement here was in the calculation of the amount of krill biomass in the Scotia Sea, and that calculation feeds into actually the management of the fishery and how much the krill fishery can take and obviously how much we leave behind uh, to make sure that the higher predators um, are um, have enough food uh, and the population is sustained. 
Um, so coming back to this theme, 2010, about 30% of cruise participants presented as women and 10% as chief scientists. Moving forward, in 2012, um, I got involved in autonomous vehicles. Um, and so uh, within a, a project with Karen Haywood at the University of East Anglia, um, we started to put echo sounders onto autonomous vehicles. Um, and we went out on a cruise that year um, to go and look at that in the Weddell Sea. Uh, and I kind of bring that up because that's a theme I've carried on as well since then, is looking at the use of autonomous vehicles um, to either, either well, less to replace, but I would say to augment the kind of temporal and spatial view that we have of the ecosystem. Um, in 2015, um, I then got involved actually uh, specifying the biological capacity or capability, if you like, um, of the SDA. And I think, you know, from, from my perspective as somebody who's, who's always loved going to sea, probably if I knew that I could have gone to sea as a mariner, maybe I'd have had a different career. Um, uh, but I got involved in specifying some of the SDA and I've, I've been involved in that bill um, all the way through. So 2015, again, uh, we're starting to, to see a shift upwards, if you like, in the participation of people um, in the cruises. Uh, and that brings me through to 2020. So this is a sneak preview for people, I suppose. These are photographs that were taken about two weeks ago um, of the laboratories. And the left-hand side is actually the deck laboratory. So it's a, a kind of place where you might take samples and have a microscope and, and look at what taxa they are, or you might go and do some filtering or something like that. Um, and the right-hand side is uh, what we've called the data suite, um, which is kind of probably where you do some of your cruise planning um, and, uh, and also do some of your analysis. Um, so in 2020, um, looking at all four of those ships, or, or three of the ships, because only, only if we look at 2020, we're, we're only at the point now where the discovery for the James Cook and the James Clark Ross are in, are in kind of use. So 40% of cruise participants presented as women and 35% of chief scientists. Um, I think, uh, so this was just looking at it over time. Um, if you like, this is the data now, a uh, year on the x-axis and percentage presenting as women on the y-axis. And I just happen to have the pictures of everybody over the right-hand side, so I'll just move that. Um, and I, I think what we can really see is, is, is progress through time um, to, towards a better um, equality of, of, of presentation of those two binary genders. And I think, I think this is where, where that's an area of discussion into the future about how we look at all, all um, gender spectrum. But I suppose it's trying to kind of show evidence that, that we are moving towards a, a, a better balance, certainly in that binary view, um, and we need to continue to progress further. Um, the, the position of women in, in high, higher roles as chief scientist is, is still lacking, if you like. Um, and, and this, I think, is, you know, it, is, it's, it's just some of it is the lag behind of women in those higher roles. Some of it is still potentially the kind of leaky pipe, um, something we need to focus on. Um, there are, so if I move to the Western Core Box cruises, and I kind of brought these up because these are, these are specifically the cruises that, um, that I've been involved in at Bass um, since about 1995. Um, and I think what's really interesting there is actually, if you look at it, in the last five years, every single PSO has been a woman. Um, and that the uh, actual, gen, the, the, the balance of um, women uh, is, is above 50%. Um, but there are, there are some areas in particular that we need to do better in. This is in the science party, and we're, we're still noticing looking at, at some of this that, you know, our engineering roles um, should be, uh, uh, need, need to progress better, if I say, in our balance of, uh, of people, and we need to encourage that. Um, I wanted to bring up some people that I think, again, it's kind of retrospective role models over time that I've met. I met Vicky Ald actually as she was base commander going in for, or sorry, station leader going into Bird Island. Um, and Vicky's kind of now is one of our pilots um, flying the Dash uh, as well as the Twin Otters. 
Um, and I think, uh, so another person I met who was actually a cadet uh, or then the third officer um, on the ship was Jo Cox. Um, she actually went off to be the first uh, woman captain of the UK research vessels. Um, she was captain of Discovery um, before she moved on. Um, Karen Hayward's actually been a presence in, in my career right from right from my first job. She was actually a co-I on the grant that I was employed on. Um, but I, I went on to um, be involved in, in many grants now with her um, since I've worked at Bass. Um, and I think that, you know, she, she definitely is somebody that I use as an informal mentor to ask questions of sometimes, um, whether she knows that herself. Um, and I think you know the other the other person I wanted to mention is Bjork Aitken, who's who's here today, if you like. And I think um, I very much you know go forward into thinking that the women or or um, all people should should be capable uh, or or able to to do the jobs that they want to do. Um, so I think it's it's just worth looking at that. Um, Kate hopefully might talk more about this. I think this is just to come out uh, very shortly in Ocean Challenge. Um, and I think it's a, a really nice cape, a lot, lot of effort into, into this article. And I have to say, I mean, it, as I said, it started in March, I think. Um, and and I, I don't think I've had as much dialogue or as many emails about terminology, uh, about understanding of um, terms and influences and, and trying to think about strategies of inclusivity um, uh, uh, in the community um, as this article's kind of created. So um, I, I would advise you or encourage you, if you like, to go and have a look at it. Um, and I suppose uh, I just thought I'd show mostly a sea of orange, really, which is uh, shows how many bass cruises I've done, but an interesting spectrum over the years of all the, all the cruise participants that I've been involved with. That's it, sorry. <laughs> That's, That's excellent. Sophie, really, really great talk. Um, uh, it, it has been an amazing journey, hasn't it? From the little one in the bucket uh, all the way through to um, these cruises. How many times have you been the senior scientist or, or led the cruise? Oh, uh, hopefully nobody quote me if I'm wrong. I think it's probably somewhere between seven, eight times now. It might be more, less, not sure, but yeah, um, quite a few. <laughs> and is there only one um, that lead scientist on each cruise or is there sort of one for different areas? So the way a lot of this, uh, well, certainly the way we run the cruises, we have, we have one chief scientist. That person is usually, I mean, their main role, to be honest, is to act as that liaison person um, between the science party and the um, ship's crew and officers. Um, and so they're, they're, they're there to um, take the science to, you know, to, to try and ensure that all the science goes on, that everybody gets what they need from the crews. Um, and ensure that that information is passed through to the captain about where you want to go, about what you want to do. So, you, you know, you quite often make daily plans. Um, but within your science party, you obviously have a lot of different people. They may be lead PIs, they may be there doing their PhD. And hopefully, you know, the idea is that you have those meetings with people to get all of that information. So you're, you're really the communication conduit um, rather than the, the head poncho. Um, there to pass it, yeah, pass it on. It, it is a very important progression, though, through a career. Um, can you tell us what what do you think the key criteria is to step up from being, um, you know, a, a crew scientist through to that leadership role? What do you think the key criteria to obtaining those positions are? Is it just experience, or are there other elements? Um, I think there's experience, I think there's opportunity. And actually one of the discussions that, um, one of the discussions I think that came about in, in the science community with the discussion about Kate's article was, was exactly how people got those opportunities to, to have those leadership positions. And, and that in fact, if you're in a higher education institute, it's actually harder possibly, 
possibly than than if you're in a government institute because in a government institute you you know we have a lot of um national capability cruises that go annually and so we take people annually and it, it gives us the opportunity um, to create mentoring programs where we can bring certain people on and say right you know we'll bring you on you can you can be the co-chief scientist um, and we'll we'll take you and and um, and hopefully work with you if you like and and train you to to be a chief scientist in the future if you're if you only go to sea on grant related work like you do in, in HEIs, um, so you put in the way it works there is you, you well, the way it works at BAS, but um, we have those national capability cruises. So you put in a grant um, to use ship time to get your science uh, and you basically um, identify then who your chief scientist is going to be. Um, but there are some challenges there because obviously the operators would like somebody who has some experience to be chief scientist because it is a challenging role and it is about managing expectations primarily. Um, so they tend to kind of prefer somebody who at least has been to sea before so they have some understanding um, of, of you know, what's involved. Um, but having identified this, actually Penny Holiday, uh, who's a physical oceanographer at, at, at NAC, um, has led an application that I've been involved in to NERC um, to offer opportunities to early career researchers. Um, they're actually funded opportunities, not, not I'm afraid funding for your salary, but funding for TNS um, to come on our national capability cruises um, and to participate as as code chief scientists so that we can train those people who don't normally get that opportunity. Um, that was just accepted by NERC and I've just had emails on that. So hopefully in the near future, I think it will be three, three national capability cruises a year will offer this opportunity. Um, and it will be an open opportunity in the, in the UK to, to come on and be a, a co-chief scientist and, and learn uh, more about the role. Um, so I think mentoring is one of them. I think opportunity is is definitely challenging. Um, you know, it, 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 there are, yeah, I mean, where, where you have more routine cruises, I think you have more of a, a requirement to, to bring people on to share the load. Um, and that's good, but you have less opportunity outside of those arenas. And, and so, yeah, so hopefully this this uh, new opportunity um, will, will enable people to develop. Um, yeah, that sounds like a very strong initiative. I, uh, my learnings of this research and uh, world, these, these lead roles are definitely key to attaining promotion and funding and grants, et cetera, which is all a tight little circle of success. So that sort of initiative that does share that leadership role and, and um, prompt, you know, CV improvement is fantastic. There's also been a lot of talk just recently about cohorts. And as your data has shown, there certainly has been an increase. Though it's been a bit jagged sometimes of, you know, just your, your, your number of uh, people who present as women onto, on the vessels. Do you think as a cohort, it's easier um, to get on board these cruises where you could are a minority and yet if you have a cohort of people it helps strengthen your ability to to do the job um i don't know I, the only thing i wonder and and you know there are other people here who are, sea, who are seagoing um scientists may have something in there um i got the impression from from this article with kate that um there are people who may not have been to sea before who um, are concerned about you're going into a small community and, and how you can present yourself and whether you want to be yourself or whether you want to be somebody else. Um, and I think that, so I can't decide whether, as you say, in a cohort, if you've got people around you who you know, does that mean that you're better able to present as you want to be or, or, or maybe not and I, I, I'm not really sure of that um, but I kind of I'd like to hope and encourage people that I think that the certainly my experience um, but you know that's just mine and so that's the challenge with this it's a very one-sided qualitative view um, it, it is that um, 
people are able to do that if they want. But I think I think it's I don't know. I think I think that's that's one one fear I think is there, and I don't know how. You know, again, I'd be very interested in how to resolve that, which is it is a small community, um, and I think it does face those issues that if you're not familiar with that community, um, if you're you know, yeah, is it easier to go on a cruise with at least one other person that you know? It probably is because you've got somebody that you know you can ask those questions of that perhaps you don't want to ask more openly so I think it's it's quite important that people you know who are like myself or anybody else are very open about saying well you know contact me with questions I am open to the science questions but I'm also open to those questions that relate to just living and being on board a ship and some of the some of the trials that you might anticipate and some that you might not Excellent. Kate, you've got your hand up there. Thank you. I just thought I'd just say thank you for the plug, really. I thought that was very nice of you to advertise it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was talking with another co-author yesterday, actually, and uh, and I said to her, you know, it has been a blooming long road with this article, but I'm really glad we travelled it, actually, in the end. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that. It's actually, the proofs were only finalised yesterday, so it'll be out soon, and I'm sure we can circulate it around when it's available. Um, but the other thing I was going to raise, which is actually another thing that came out of this article, because um, one of the recommendations we made directly as a sort of almost like a challenge to the Challenger Society was to have a special interest group about equality, diversity, inclusivity and accessibility issues. And um, so the editor of Ocean Challenge kind of just turned around to me and said, all right, then do it. So um, I've actually, with a few of us, put together a proposal um, for the Challenger Society Council for a new special interest group. Um, they were very enthusiastic and they're going to consider it formally at their next AGM, which I think is coming up in the next two or three weeks or so. So hopefully we'll actually have a special interest group where we can actually carry on this conversation, which I think would be great. That's fantastic. Thanks, Kate. Philby. Um, yeah, I wondered, Sophie, like, how, like, this is quite a personal question, but like, how does it make you feel to, in a way, have to talk about these topics, about like being a woman uh, that's uh, seagoing, like, and not just kind of let that be and like just do your job like and has that changed maybe in the last five months as you've been doing like the other work as well with the article and such um <sighs> hmm well, I have these discussions with my other half quite frequently, and, and we have we have kind of um, differing views uh, um, about you know I I've struggled sometimes with the idea of um, how much to champion it and how much not to champion it, um, and and actually my other half would like to champion it more than me quite frequently, um, and and that always amuses me, um, uh, but I think. Um, I think what I'm learning really is that I'm very, I feel very privileged that actually I, however naive it may be, I, I kind of feel like I've taken a course and apart from sometimes feeling a little isolated in a, in a room um, and not wanting to talk about topics, certain topics, um, that have stereotypical <laughs> um, kind of uh, genders associated with them. Um, I kind of, I suppose that's where I was trying to look at my retrospective role models, where I think I just felt like I had people who just kind of went and did stuff. And so um, I'm not sure I ever felt challenged in not being able to do it. Um, but having said that, I also, I've got more, vocal at times I think in the last few years where where somebody has actually um kind of yeah I, I went to a first aid course where at the end of the meeting the kind of guy said is right can we take some strong men and carry the stuff out of 
out of the room and I did turn around and go well I'm perfectly capable of doing it myself you know it's not a it's not a kind of you know that's a very stereotypical view and and even even this week I actually got a an, an example letter which was dear sirs and I just wrote back and went well that's bad form isn't it you know we we kind of need to move on from these things um so I I don't think I'm answering your question, but I do feel actually it's important to point out where things aren't right. And I have probably got more, more vocal about that. And I suppose as I've got older, I've kind of thought, well, actually just seeing people doing things and assuming it's the normality is what we need. Um, and I, you know, I, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the thing that I feel we need to do. And that's why I think the study is also difficult because it has that binary women man identity, um, and it's much more of a struggle, I think, to look at some of the the yeah to look at some other spectrums and how do we move forward and kind of identify that that you know the spectrum is the way forward, and how can we look at that change? Oops, sorry. <laughs> Excellent. I think, yeah. I think, Sophie, and I've said this to you before, the way oh. you're um, looking at your study this year is a very evolved way. You know, the, the gender split to try and understand gender equality through the last 20 years, you know, has been looked at through a very thin lens. And you guys and Kate, you've looked at it and discussed it with this new understanding of the non-binary, which I think is very commendable. I think there's still a strong message there. We are getting more people who present as women on the vessels and we're getting them into leadership roles. And I think that's a win for science and a win for culture. So I think that message is very important because as you just referred to, if we don't have those role models and those stories of success and positivity out there, then in these particular times, you know, we're just going to get negative stories about science and you know in the end we I think we all want more people of a greater diversity into science so we can have that innovation um I do have another question does anyone else have any other questions as well if you do just pop uh, uh, your virtual hand up or take your mute off but I was going to say Sophie you were presented with the polar medal in 2019 and I think that's an extraordinary achievement and congratulations for that. I, I think, you know, that I believe that is not a, a very easy medal to have been awarded. So congratulations. What, what's your feeling on that recognition of that medal and the effect and, and um, the power for you, but also do you have an idea about this nomination and how you how we don't nominate many women for things and and if we increase that what benefit we would get um <laughs> i i think with the polar medal i think actually if you if you look back over the last few years i think that there are more women who have have been nominated um i think we you know that that i suppose as 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 more women come through in position, there, there are there are a number of women who who um, who have been nominated over the last few years. One of the, I'll shift it somewhat actually, and I think that one of one of the things that was highlighted from the from the study that Kate was leading was was actually that there's a there's a lot of honours and medals that are issued in men's names. Um, and actually, there was a recognition that we should start to bring more women uh, and their achievements through into some of the names of these medals. So that that is starting to happen. But I think that's a recognition that, you know, it's not just a, 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 a man's world out there. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question. I, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not sure I know of the mechanism of polar medals and how those are awarded. Um, and all I can say is, you know, I had an, had an interesting day and it was probably very surreal. Um, and I've got a very, very pretty silver 50p piece medal. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a real honour actually, because I, I think the history of that medal um, 
Hugh's got his hand up. Yeah. Where you go, Hugh? It's a real shame you didn't get the one that was named after a woman instead of the ones that are kind of generic or men's names because the Martha Muse Prize, which is named after a woman, comes with $100,000 as well. And that was awarded to polar people as well. So it's quite funny that the only one that was actually worth cash was the one named after a woman. <laughs> yeah. But I think that, but I think that, oh, Toby's back. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 sorry. It, it, you, go ahead. Oh, my comment was a little bit off piece. No, no, that's all right. I, I can't remember. Now, was it the Martha News that you got, Hugh? Are you trying to I tell us wish, something? I wish. It's now stopped. My heritage <laughs> received it, and now nobody's ever getting it again. So I don't know whether that's a reflection on him <laughs> or whether they run out of money, but I don't know. But... <laughs> I think it is important that recognition though and as you say if we're looking for role models the awards and, and recognition system um, yeah I, I do not know the UK stats off the top of my head but both nominations and awardees you know are definitely skewed gender wise uh, and race wise so um, you know it's just definitely an area where attention and some positive encouragement to nominate, I think is really powerful because I think that those awards do, they recognize fantastic work and they do empower people to use their voice and to share their story. So I think if anyone's thinking of nominating people for polar medals then and, and any other medals out there, then you should really consider it because it doesn't take that much time and you, you can get amazing results. So does anyone have any other questions for Sophie? We do have one in the text. Mariella wanted to check with you. What sort of piece of advice would you give someone who's uh, starting out as a marine biologist now and sort of, um, yeah, what sort of advice would you give them about a career that was as interesting and adventurous as yours? Um, I think my advice is, um, certainly career-wise, follow what you want to do. I don't think there should be any barriers to any person for, for certainly for, you know, the issues we've been talking today about in terms of equality, diversity. And however hard it is, if you find that there are barriers, um, speak up about them, find somebody to speak up about them with um, and, and take that forward. Because I think that, I think that one of the things I do feel now is that where, where we see inequality or, um, uh, I mean, this follows right through to bullying, harassing and everything like that. You know, we, we have a responsibility to speak out about this. And I think that if we start to, if we start to make a society where it's, it's just socially unacceptable for that behavior and, and you know, then, then I think that that makes the society more pleasant for other people. So if I was, I, you know, if I was gonna, start again I I mean I I have always perhaps kind of questioned if somebody would look at me and say you shouldn't be doing that and ask why and I will always continue to do that because you know give me a good reason rather than than a bad reason um and I think where you get a bad reason I think you I think you you need to fight back excellent response excellent all righty um we're coming up to time uh, does anyone have any last questions for Sophie? She's been peppered <laughs> with, with quite a few, but um, oh, no, I, would, I take the, the opportunity then just to thank you, Sophie. Thank you for your joining of many Polar Horizons talks and always having great questions for our, our speakers, but also for your work. It's as we saw in that movie that you uh, circulated, um, which, which name you'll accurately tell me. Picture a scientist. Ah, the picture of a. That's a good point. That's yeah. That's still around. If anybody, if I, I don't, I don't know if you forwarded that to the Polar Horizons group. Um, I think I did. That is, um, that is as far as I'm aware. The the password still works, um, and I think it makes for very interesting watching. Yes, um, it, is. it definitely does. And you uh, haven't seen it. There, there is the comment there that you know it takes time out of people's careers and lives and days to fight the fight which is quite frequently what people of minorities have to do and um, even choosing this year 
in these time frames with Kate and the work you're doing, you know, to look at equality over the time frame and to to try and find those good stories. That's that's as much effort outside your scientific work as you know fighting for in it for your know, improvements. So I would definitely like to thank you. Thank you for your comments and um, participation with our talks, and thank you so much for your talk today. It was brilliant. It clearly shows your journey, but also how you take other people along with you and helps us understand that we do have mentors and role models out there. And if we gave some thought to it, that they would probably appreciate being thanked as well. And that would strengthen their energy to be a role model for other people. So Sophie, you're a role model for me and I appreciate very much your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Thank <laughs> you.